right. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Jason Strait. Uh, hopefully, you're here to hear about integrating cloud into your data strategy. Um, I think it's interesting that 36% of you are not looking at bringing the cloud into your data strategy at this time. Um, I would also wonder if, but 36%, I think, 36%. Anyways, um, I, think, I think that's interesting. Um, so hopefully, uh, as we go through this today, um, I give you guys some ideas on where you can integrate cloud um, into your data strategy, not, not to steal my title over and over again, but to, to give you that opportunity to kind of see where, where it can fit, where, where you can get some value out of it, and where it can be there as a natural extension to what you folks are already doing. Um, it's, it's interesting when I talk to a lot of customers about the, the, them not using cloud for their um, data strategy, but using it for lots of other areas within their organizations or within their personal lives. You know, people using OneDrive, using Google Drive, um, Amazon Music Service, Xbox Music Service, Salesforce, these are all cloud offerings. And so it, it, I always find it interesting when people are, you know, you use it for your personal files, uh, but you won't use it for business. But, but let's, uh, let's get in and get started here. Um, so my name is Jason Strait. I'm a solutions architect here at Pragmatic Works. Uh, I've been doing this stuff for a number of years. Um, if as we go through this, you guys have questions, please uh, leave, leave the questions in the um, webinar. Or if after the fact that something comes up and you have a question about it, about the cloud or whatever, the, you know, however we th we're talking about things here, um, you know, just reach out and uh, I'll do my best to uh, answer your questions. Uh, but let's get going and start talking about what we're talking about here, talking about this this topic of using cloud in your, in your data strategy, and let's first talk about your data because as we've worked with our customers over the last few years and um, talked about what they're doing with their data and what it is that they want to do, there's a few common threads that come through all the time, and this is just discussions around building a foundation. Uh, getting platforms that grow with customers' needs, allowing changes in scales. Gartner had a uh, statistic that they put out every every few years that they let people you know remind people about is that every five years, your data is 10x in size. Well, 10x in size, that's a scale that you have to be able to accommodate for. And when it comes to your data, you need to be able to reinvest in that data. And, and what I mean by that is this is really that, that, that promise of business intelligence and analytics, that finding out information about your data based on your data. And so the way in which we've been talking about our customers and the way that we've found that most of our customers are interacting with their data and which really resonates with our customers is, is what we call our data lifecycle optimization. Um, this isn't just the way in which we're working with our data. Um, this is the way in which a lot of organizations are already wor working with, with their data. Um, just this just happens with the um, way that we put it together that really aligns to that to, to, to the, the way which which people interact with it, and that's basically the idea of starting out with an architecture and configuration. You're know, building that platform for your data. You know, if you don't have that, if you don't have that foundation, it's hard to get anywhere else. But once we've we uh, you know talk through customers with architecture and configuration. A lot of times it's then availability and continuity. You know, I, I've got a place for the data. Let's make sure I keep a place for the data. And then performance and optimization. Can I get to my data and get it to return to me when I want it to? You know, that's a lot of, that's oftentimes the, the big focus in transactional systems. Um, but it also applies to BI solutions. And when you're looking more in depth at BI solutions, there's the enterprise BI. You know, how do you find actionable information within your data? And then, you know, going on and building that through all the way through a predictive and analytics solution and then tying that all back. And, and quite honestly, this is, this data lifecycle optimization is really why I got into working with data 15 years ago because I was working with a company and we were doing fraud analysis with um, merchant cards and basically going to the, you know, looking at the companies that were processing transactions and trying to figure out a way of finding most effectively how we can identify opportunities where people are going to try and steal money from the bank. Not from an individual card perspective, but from a, I've just processed all these hundreds of cards, now can I take all the money? 
and not deliver the goods. And, and, and that would happen. And then, you know, we hear about these kind of fraud cases from time to time. And when I start working with data, we really start building up this platform. But shortly after we got it going, we realized that the 30 to 50,000 records that were popping out every day in our reports wasn't really an effective use of of, of, of our of our time. And so we spent a lot of time building out reports only to find that we couldn't get through all those reports. We ended up going in and looking at business and predictive analytics. We brought in a SaaS team, not just a SaaS person, but a SaaS team that gave us the ability to build out some analytics, which we then brought back into the architecture for the app. <coughs> of course, I had to do a little bit of performance tuning. But once we were able to get to that point, we had a new level of enterprise BI that we could look at that gave us a much clearer idea of who was going to try and take money. And interestingly enough, back then when we were working on it, we found out that people that were selling golf clubs over the internet um, had a really good chance of never paying the bank the money that they're or giving the golf clubs to the uh, uh, to, to their to their um, customers. And so those are the kinds of situations that we're looking at from a life cycle perspective and today what I want to talk about is how can we take those kinds of use cases and apply them into cloud computing patterns and scenarios and so when you're looking at cloud there's a number of areas where cloud really does fit with what you're doing and a lot of it ties into not being able to have a data center or have servers that can always map to the max amount of capacity that you want to have. So the first pattern that, that um, is oftentimes seen in cloud computing is the whole concept of being on and off. And that's the idea of, hey, I've got an SSIS server. I know that I run all my jobs in the morning. They run from 9 to 11 a.m. Um, outside of that, I don't need it anymore. And, and actually, this is something that we did with a customer a couple of years back. They had that exact scenario. And what they really wanted to use was Enterprise Edition. But who's going to pay for Enterprise Edition for an SSIS box when you only need to take care of a cup, take take advantage of a couple of features, and it's going to be idle for 11 twelfths of a day. So you know, for for 22 out of 24 hours, you're not using it. That's an incredibly large misallocation of resources. But they really needed that that time window, and so what we did is we looked at using cloud, and we processed everything in a in in an, a virtual machine. That gave them gave us the ability that we could just turn it off and not pay for the time that we were not leveraging the machines. One of the other patterns that you often see when it comes to cloud computing is the ability of growing fast. You know, you don't know how fast or how big or how large you're going to grow. You know it's going to go quickly, and you're going you know that you're going to have a lot of data, but you don't know what that max capacity is going to be. And sometimes you don't want to have that max capa max capacity. You know, maybe it's for just backups. There's often times where I've, I've talked to customers or, or, or had scenarios where I've been working in a, in a company where we have to make decisions about how many backups we're going to keep that is completely unrelated to the RPO and the RTO. So we have to set ourselves up into a scenario where we can't achieve our RPO and RTO because, well, we only have X amount of disk available. Cloud storage capabilities gives us a bit, the ability to have that that fast growth. The the other area is that unpredictable demand, where you don't know when there's going to be a spike. You know, if you've if you've got a situation like the stock market, where you don't know the day that the stock market's going to be extremely busy, but that predictive analytics solution that you have built on it has to always be able to keep up. And so if you don't know when that, that peak is going to come, how do you accommodate for it? Especially when you don't know how big the peak is going, going to be. Uh, cloud solutions offer ability, an ability to be able to accommodate for that unpredictable demand and have resources available and aligned to your solution. And the last piece is that predictable bursting. You know that you're going to have on the 15th and the 30th additional resource capacity required, but do you really need to always be at your peak. What if your peak is only once every 90 days, and at that peak you need 90%, but when you're off your peak you only need 10% of those resources? Do you really need or want to be leveraging a platform that always has to pay for 
max capacity plus say 5%. What if you can dial it back so that the seasonality of your workload is what you actually pay for? And so those are some of the things that really drive needing to do and go and look at cloud computing and patterns and scenarios. And the ways that you do cloud computing is, is it basically breaks down into three different areas. There's infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. In the context of what we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk primarily about infrastructure as a service and how that, those patterns can align to your environment and platform as a service. Uh, there is Within, within all these, there's features within Azure that, that align to these, these requirements. Now, we're not going to talk about all of them. We're just going to talk about them in context of that data lifecycle optimization that I talked about at the beginning and, and use that to marry back to the, the needs of your platform. Um, if, if, uh, if, if we have the time, we talk a bit about software as a service, but the only real you know, good key feature of uh, software as a service that Azure has right now is, is the websites, and that's a little bit outside the context of what we're talking about today. And so let's talk about how we can pull these together and, so, and some of those needs. And I've already mentioned some of the cloud computing um, patterns, but there's also some driving needs that really align customers and align the people that, that we've been working with to the need to look at cloud capabilities. Uh, the first is elastic scale and growth, the ability to reduce the lead time to get the resources that you need. When I go out to customers and I talk to them about, hey, you know, you're on SQL Server 2008 right now, uh, we think that you guys need to go to SQL Server 2012 or 2014. Um, sometimes I get a couple, a couple customers that are kind of locked into 2012 just because of the types of applications they have. But they want to be able to move that forward but after we do the assessment, we talk about what the plan is, we get it laid out, then we have that eight to nine to ten weeks while we wait for servers. And sometimes even longer than that. We had a recent engagement where we got the servers delivered, started on time, and then customs said, well, no, we're not going to let those servers go through, and you're not going to be able to have them. Um, we eventually got them through, but those are the kinds of things that get in the way of, of, of uh, non-cloud solutions. You know, the ability to, to get that those resources are available. And so what happens now if with those servers that were de recently deployed and we had the customs issue, what if we need more memory? What if we need more CPU? You know, it's it's not going to be an easy growth rate if we have any of those. And so cloud solutions and Azure specifically give you the ability to scale up your machines as you need them. Companies also want to optimize their investments. You don't want to pay for what you're not using. You don't want to have to pay for today what you might use in five years if the project you're on is successful and you get all the data that you want into it. And so you want to be able to pay pretty much as you go. You pay for the, the storage that you're using, pay for the compute that, the, you're, you're, that you're using, disable resources that you're not using so you don't pay for them at all, and be able to self-service provision all of these capabilities as you go through, not having to wait for resources to be available and allocated, um, be able to be allocated out by the, the infrastructure team, you know, having a pool that's large enough where there is really, by and large, no max capacity. You know, even if you're doing private cloud, there is still max, max capacity, and that private cloud still has to have an investment of what is the max capacity of your organization versus, you know, in cloud solutions, they have to have a max capacity of what everyone may possibly purchase. So those are always growing, and, and they're making those internal investments. There's also, the, the, as I mentioned, that maximization of investments. You know, if you need to extend an existing solution, you know, get more out of it. If you want seamless integration into all those pieces, Azure and cloud solutions can give you this. You can also use it to enhance your high availability and provide disaster recovery by leveraging the multiple data centers that we have. Not every organization can have multiple data centers. I talked to a customer yesterday. They don't have a data center, but they have a closet where the server is sitting. Well, having the, the, that server in the closet, you know, that, that may work for your on-premise data, but how do you back that up? How do you make sure that if your building burns down or something happens to it, how do you ensure that you can still get to that data? You know, sure, you got backups, but what's the server? What's the solution? How fast can you get that data back up? And um, 
Azure gives you some of those capabilities. So let's start talking about some specifics here. I've talked a little bit about general pieces. Let's talk specifically about how you can map some of the um, areas within the data lifecycle optimization directly into Azure capabilities. Uh, so I'm not going to cover everything, but I'm going to cover some highlights and hopefully give you guys some ideas on where you can get going and how you can start building out your platform and, and getting more out of it today. And so let's start with our with architecture and configuration. We'll look at the, this from a cloud data strategy perspective. And so what you're looking at here is, so three areas where people can start off today is your development and test, running through consolidations, and disaster recovery. You know, all three of these use cases are areas where I see um, customers have, having struggles and not able to get what they want out of their on-premise platforms to be able to build out what they, what they need. And when it comes to development and test, I've worked with a lot of customer companies where they just don't have development. They don't have a test environment. Um, if they do have them, they're not um, similar enough to the production environment that they provide reasonable tests. And when it comes to building out development and test environments through a cloud solution, you can, in most cases, create a solution that's almost identical to your on-premise. So maybe you can't move your on-premise solution to the cloud, but you most likely can move components, test data, the architecture to the cloud to be able to mimic what you're doing on-premise. And that's what one of the things that you can really do. You know, consolidation, you know, maybe what you want to do is take a number of services and consolidate them back down, uh, but you don't have enough room in your private cloud or you just don't have the, the, the dollars to invest in a bigger, larger machine. Well, you can consolidate those not into a private cloud, but consolidate them out to the, to the Azure cloud. You know, through, well, as one, one option is through virtual machines. You know, virtual machines is one of the, cap the core capabilities that you have in Azure that allows you to build out a, a virtual machine nearly identical to building out a virtual machine on-premise, you know, in, in, in large part, it's the, kind of the same thing. The nice thing about it is that from an Azure perspective, what you're really looking at is having pre-configured templates. So pre-configured templates is really that, that promise of the private cloud that oftentimes doesn't get delivered. You know, templates for SQL Server, for Windows Server, for SharePoint, um, for actually about 3,000 other different um, product and feature combinations that you can grab on demand. And the nice thing about the templates that go here that, that you can access within Azure is they're templates that are updated as time goes on. So if I go out and buy, if I go out and install um, SharePoint onto, uh, onto a, a private cloud, uh, the next time I, am, uh, I deploy it, if there's been an update to SharePoint, so SharePoint, you know, SP, let's say five, and we go through and we have that, have that available, you know, from an Azure perspective, that's going to be updated and available for you to go go with, and so you can just build a machine out that way. All of the virtual machines that are out there have different sizing levels that really determine how the, how the resource is going to be, be available. The other area where you can look at consolidation is not just in virtual machines, but also in SQL database. So the Azure SQL database is a managed relational database platform. It's a platform as a service on the Azure environment uh, for a good share of the features that, that you see on the on-premise version of SQL Server. Those same features are in SQL database. SQL database gives you the ability to do pretty much most of what you would want to do within a SQL Server. Um, a lot of the exceptions for features that aren't in SQL database that are in SQL Server on-premise are things like availability groups, database mirroring, uh, replication, you know, high availability features, um, backup commands, and the re reason why these don't show up in SQL database is because they're managed through the platform. So in SQL database, you have your data being replicated. In SQL database, you have backups automatically being taken, and so that gives you the ability to offload some of those. And the, the area where I see this really helping out when it comes to data strategies is if you're, if you're working with a, or are, a third-party tool vendor, if you've got a software application that you're providing to your customers, 
is is the value in what you provide the database that you host for them, or is the value that you provide in the application? In in pretty much every case, I'm going to say it's in the application. The data is important, but your your core competence competency is that application, not the ability to host. And I've worked with a number of customers, and we we talk through what their problems and their issues are. And you know, I've I've got customers where they've got almost I think one of my customers has about I think 600 databases per SQL Server instance, and they've had to become SQL Server experts just because of the volume of databases. Well, what if you can decide not to become, you know, deep technical experts in SQL Server, let that platform be managed by, say, Azure, and put all of that core competency, all of that expertise back into your application to make your application better and make your application more robust and get more out of the platform. And that's where, where we see some of our customers moving their back-end databases to Azure. Let Azure do the hosting for that so that you can get more out of it. And so the, the SQL database has a number of benefits. I've talked a little about some of these, but you know, you know, built-in high availability, automatic disaster recovery, minimal maintenance, scale-out growth, so you can select different templates and different sizes for your, plat, your, your application to determine you know, how, much, how many resources go into it. And I mentioned that the uh, the vendor application uh, deployment, and this is really an area where if, if, if you're a third-party vendor, um, SQL database and the hosted managed SQL server database solution is, is really something I strongly encourage. It, it really gives you the ability to focus your application on the pieces that you want to focus on versus the pieces that you're forced to, to focus on because of the scale of SQL Server and the, the density of the databases that you're deploying. Now, as we've talked about it, uh, we talked a bit about configuration already, so let's talk about that next area within the data lifecycle optimization, and that's the availability and continuity. So in the last section, I mentioned that one of the use cases that we have with customers is disaster recovery, and that kind of fits under availability and continuity, uh, but there's also a few a few other areas. So, so let's say, let's first start by talking talking about customers that don't want to move anything to the cloud whatsoever. You've got a good on-premise solution, you've got, you've got it built out. You know, from there, you know, maybe the first thing that you want to start looking at is how do I do backups? You know, I mentioned backups at the beginning. Um, backups is, is oftentimes a pretty uh, strenuous area because it takes up a lot of space within your data center. Um, SAN admins don't necessarily want to carve out you know, a third to a half of a SAN for backups, but you need to have enough backups to achieve your RPOs and your RTOs. Backing up to Azure gives you that ability to have as much space as you need without chewing up all of your SAN. Because you don't need the disk to be the fastest in the world, you just need the backups to be able to be um, accessible. And so you, you can back up directly to Azure Storage, um, this ways to integrate it all the way through to SQL Server 2005, and you can do your backups and your restores straight through straight through Azure Storage. Uh, beyond that, you have capabilities to do high availability. Now, when it comes to SQL Database, as I mentioned, SQL Database has automatic failover. Um, you get multiple replicas as part of it, so it's already baked into the service. You don't have to have those considerations and all that configuration put together. Uh, but then there's also the virtual machines. So the virtual machines is the area where, you know, you're looking at building something that's, you know, fairly similar to what you already have. And from an availability perspective, you can do things like geographically or regionally disperse your virtual machines. And what I mean by that is a geographically dispersed data center is data centers that are on different continents from where you're at. Regionally is on the same continent. Um, oftentimes, especially if you're a small to medium-sized company, doing regional or geographic data centers, you know, there aren't many small companies that are going to have a data center on another continent. Not unless they're really small because they're just and they have just you know tons of money being coming coming through. But, you know, highly highly profitable. Um, you know, when you're when you're looking at what it is that companies can invest in, 
Um, oftentimes, data centers is multiple data centers is not uh, the, the highest level um, expense. And then within there as well, they'll, with the high availability, you have availability sets to help ensure when you're setting up things like always on availability groups that you're able to have your machines up at the level that you're expecting for them to be up. Now adding on to high availability is disaster recovery. And so with disaster recovery, you have the always on availability groups, which ties in a bit to what I was talking about here with virtual machines and the availability sets. But when it comes to disaster recovery, you can do asynchronous transactions across multiple Azure data centers to allow for manual recovery and manual failover. And that gives you the ability to have, you know, even for a small company and all the way through to a, to a large organization, the ability to within your platform, regardless of how many data centers that your company owns and manages, that you can tie your, your, your data solution into a recoverable solution so that regardless of what happens to your data center, you're able to get back up. You always also, you know, suppose that you have a couple data centers already. You know, one of the things that comes up at that point is, you know, how do you move between your two data centers all of your data? Well, one of the other areas where you can look at is Site Recovery Manager, which allows through Azure the ability to synchronize virtual machines between data centers. So your two data centers can be synchronized using Site Recovery Manager through Azure. And this currently works great with Hyper-V. Uh, they're building in VMware support for this. And so what you're going to be able to do is, whether you're VMware, whether you're Hyper-V, you know, however you're virtualizing your platform, Azure can actually help you do all the synchronization and keep it all under the you know, one set of uh, features. And so those are some of the areas from an availability and disaster recovery perspective that, that you can leverage Azure in your data strategy. So moving on, there are a number of other areas within this, uh, within the data lifecycle um, uh, optimization platform uh, um, concept. We have performance and optimization next. Now when it comes to getting the most performance out of your solution, Oftentimes, there's a few ways that we, we dig into this. Uh, we can dig into this by looking at code. We can dig into this by looking at hardware. And what, I, what I've often seen when I work with customers is that the first line of defense for fixing performance is improving the code. If you get the code set up the way that it should be and built out and have the right underlying um, code base, the next area where you start to look at is how do I add the appropriate number of resources to this to get the performance that I want. In an ideal world, you can start growing by the need of your application. So if you have if you have a, a if you have a well-defined code base for your application, as you add more code, you get better performance. I mean, that's not more code. <laughs> Sorry, not more code. As you add more resources, you get better performance. Uh, as as if you if you've talked to me in the last few years about data warehousing, I've probably talked to you back about an analytics platform system or parallel data warehouse, where you've got your application designed in a way that as you add code, I mean, not code, as you add hardware, you get better performance, and that's one of the things that you can do with Azure. So if you get that code base to where you need it to, you can then start leveraging solutions within Azure to scale your application and get that, that promise of last of growth. Now, that said, you can still add hardware in, and there are a lot of situations where adding hardware in will fix, fix this, fix the um, performance. And the nice thing about Azure is, you know, say today you have two cores and, that, and tomorrow you need four cores and the day after that you need eight cores. Azure and Cloud Solutions give you the ability to make those adjustments. Sure, you can make those same adjustments, in a private cloud. The problem with the private cloud is that there is a max capacity and the likelihood that you're going to hit that is much higher than the likelihood that you can hit that in, in a public cloud like Azure. And so when, let's take a look at two of the areas where you can do these this performance growth. So the first area is SQL database. Now I mentioned SQL database a few times. Um, I, I do like to keep going back to it because uh, I think as 
people become more familiar with SQL database and what it provides to you from a data solution strategy, the appeal of it grows every single time I go back and look at it. And so when you're looking at SQL database from a performance perspective, there's three tiers that you can, you can choose from. These three tiers, basic, standard, and premium, give you allocations of resources and features to allow you to pay for exactly what you need. So if you're going with basic, that's fairly similar to going with an express edition of SQL Server. Um, standard is you know, similar to the name. It's like a standard edition of SQL Server. And premium is similar to enterprise edition. So in premium, you can leverage column store indexes. You can leverage some um, in-memory OLTP capabilities within SQL Database. Now within those, there's also benchmarks that are set as far as what the SLAs are for each one of those. So with basic, you get automatic seven days point in time recovery. Standard, you get 14 days. Premium, you get 35 days. Now, of course, with all of those, those windows of recoverability, when it comes to the data, you can always take and make a uh, request for a backup. You know, say if you say you're using standard and from the standard you want to go through and you want to have one backup for every month, you can request at the beginning of the month to have a restore of your database into a different SQL database and then offload that with a backpack. So within each one of these tiers, though, from a performance perspective, you have a number of performance levels. And the way that these performance levels are put together is they leverage database throughput units, Azure SQL database benchmarks, and then transaction rates. And what these do in conjunction with each, with each other is they basically give you a footprint that no matter what the underlying SQL database platform is looking like, like so as, as the platform changes underneath the covers, the hardware will change over time, uh, features will change over time. As these changes occur, you can continue to look at your database and understand what your throughput is with your um, application and be able to adjust based upon not the underlying hardware, not the underlying software, but adjust based upon changes in performance need or growth in volume of your application. So if you start getting twice as many transactions going through, you'll probably see your database throughput units going up. And, you know, database throughput units are similar to TPC results for your database. They give you not, not, not a measurement based upon your code, per se, but a measurement based upon the platform and a, a measurement based upon your consumption of resources within the platform to tell you about what your, you know, for, for lack of a better term, what your mile per gallon is for, for your application. And so you can see how it's, how it's running in the background. And it's, it really is similar to a miles per gallon kind of metric. We had a customer just recently that they had, they've been, they needed to move up to the premium premium edition, and within premium edition, they went to one of the the faster tiers within there, and they wanted to improve their consumption rate, and so they did some performance tuning within the application. They were able to back down because they saw the database throughput units going going lower. They were able to back down the service level, and so within SQL Database is a good way that you can integrate all of these pieces in. And then from a performance perspective, when you're looking at the virtual machines that we've talked about, uh, the virtual machines basically are scaled out in a number of different allocations where you basically get ratios of CPU to memory. And these CPUs to memory are basically about um, giving you performance profiles where you can get predictable results. And so you can use anywhere from one to 32 cores. Actually, you can go all the way down to a shared core um, but by and large, if we're talking about SQL Server and um, SQL Server service machines, you're probably not going to do anything that uses less than four cores. Uh, when it comes to memory, you can go anywhere between 700, well, not anywhere, but you have ratios that go between 768 megabytes and 448 gigabytes. And that really gives you the ability to have the right memory footprint for what your application is. Similarly, you have storage scale, and with storage scale, you've basically got three different levels. You've got 200 IOPS per disk, you've got 500 IOPS per disk, and you've got 4K IOPS per disk. And this is basically the banner, the, um, the basic, no, the web standard and premium storage. 
in all told, if you pull this, the storage together, you can get up to 64,000 64, IOPS on a single virtual machine. And what this gives you from an application perspective is that you can build and design your virtual machine around what the scale and capacity is that you need for your application. And so it's, it gives you that ability to build out exactly what you need, get the right performance footprint. Um, sure, in order to get this scale, you have to make some decisions about how many disks you're going to have and how you're going to allocate your files onto these disks. But it gives you that, deci that, that decision making capability, not the stand team to tell you, well, you, here's the one disk you get, uh, you get what you get, and that's what you got. With Azure, you can just pull together the disks that you want and build it out that way. Additionally, if you need additional performance out of your virtual machines, um, this is new for the D-series machines that came out uh, earlier or later last year. Um, you can have local salt state disk storage, where you can store some of your applications, some of your data, on a local salt state disk, so you can get the performance profile that you want out of that. Now, we're about halfway through here uh, with the... Um, the areas within the daily lifecycle optimization that I want to cover. Um, please, uh, just as a reminder, if you have questions, please add them into the queue, and we'll cover as many of these as we can at the end. Uh, I've got three more sections that I want to go through. Uh, Enterprise BI is the next one. Uh, so Enterprise BI is really about getting that actionable insight and being able to build out the data warehousing platforms that you need for your application. And a good spot to start with that when you're talking about how you can integrate cloud into your Data, to your data strategy is let's look at what your data warehouse is today. So one of the things that, and I mentioned this earlier, is I've been talking to customers for the last couple of years a lot about APS and Parallel Data Warehouse. APS and P Parallel Data Warehouse is an MPP solution for SQL Server that runs on an appliance within your own data center. Well, that's, that's a great solution for many customers. It's not the right solution for every customer. And massively parallel processing is a solution that a lot of people need, uh, but not everyone wants or needs to make the investment in, a, in an appliance. And so SQL Data Warehouse, which is a feature that's been announced by Microsoft, but it's not publicly available yet, um, it is coming soon, gives you the ability to do T-SQL-based database. So you can leverage and access it similar to how you access just a regular SQL database today, but it's built out and designed with massively parallel processing or MPP under the covers so that you can scale your compute and storage as you have those requirements. As you need more performance, you get you add more resources in under the covers, and this is in a situation where the code that you build for it will scale with the platform because under the covers, it's going to split apart your queries and distribute those across the um, appliance, uh, well, uh, uh, the surface area of the, the, the resources and be able to split apart that, that workload. And it gives you, what it gives you is though the ability to have data warehouses that are in the tens of terabytes to hundreds of terabytes to tens of petabytes in the cloud where it's a platform as a service App, uh, solution and it just works. So you don't have to go through and configure networks, you don't have to go through and configure CPU, you don't have to go through and configure virtual machines, it's just there and it's available and it works for you. So SQL Data Warehouse is actually one of the things that I'm pretty excited about that's coming to um, Azure here uh, probably publicly this fall. Additionally, you can build data warehouses in the cloud. Uh, you can use virtual machines to build data warehouses. Um, Azure actually has images specifically built that are pre-configured for doing things like fast track data warehouse in the cloud, basically a virtual machine that's pre-optimized for data warehouses. And so if you need to build those data warehouses and get them available in the cloud, you can absolutely do that. Uh, we've got customers that are doing it today. Uh, my first Azure project about three years ago was building up data warehouses in Azure. And so we have those capabilities as well. And so as you're looking at your, your data strategy, there's a lot of different options that you have all the way through to Enterprise BI and beyond. And so in our next area here, let's talk a little bit about big data and big data architecture and deployment. With big data architecture and deployment, 
one of the things that people often look at, and one of the first areas that, that people consider is Hadoop. Uh, so Hadoop is kind of like that, that big data poster child, and when it comes to Azure and wanting to build that all out, you can do that within the Azure environment. You can deploy with Cloudera, you can deploy with Hortonworks, you can deploy on HD Insight. Um, HD Insight, if you're not aware, is basically Hortonworks on a Windows operating system. And why would you want to do Hadoop in the cloud? Why not just build out all the commodity servers that you need and get it all set up on-premise? Well, what if you don't know how many servers that you need? Do you really want to buy 10 servers and find out you need 20? Do you want to buy 40 servers and find out you need 10? Uh, cloud gives you, and, 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 the, and, and what you can do with Azure, gives you the ability that you can figure out what exactly you need from a compute perspective for your solution, build out that, pay for what you consume, and shut off the pieces that you don't. The last thing that I ever want to do in any project is come back and say, hey, I know I told you it'd be 10 servers, but I actually need 20. And even worse is that, hey, we thought we needed 40, we only need 10. Um, from a consulting perspective, that's a fairly scary, scary prospect. When I was working as a um, DBA for, with a company a number of years back, that was an even scarier prospect. You know, it's 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 not the funnest thing in the world to misallocate the amount of resources that you need for some of these capabilities. And doing these up in, in Azure gives you the ability to do that. Additionally, when we're looking at HD Insight for doing Hadoop solutions, HD Insight provides Hadoop on a Windows as a service. It's scalable, it's on demand, and gives the ability to do you know, all those things that you want to be able to do with Hadoop solutions. The nice thing about HD Insight as compared to Hortonworks and, and the Cloudera, then it's a selling point that I've got for a few of my customers is that the compute and the storage are not connected like they are in um, it, with the other two solutions I mentioned, with Cloudera and Hortonworks. For both of those, as you're building out your Hadoop cluster, your compute and your storage are, they're, they're tied in together, they're directly connected. The relationship there is un unbreakable. With HD Insight, the way that it's built out, the storage is where all the data is, that's an all in Azure storage. The compute is within the virtual machines that get built up when you're building out HD Insight. And the nice thing about that is that they're not intricately related. You can split them apart. You can just have your storage there and available, or um, put HD Insight on top of it, or, or and put HD Insight on top of it. And when you bring down those clusters, then you're only paying for the storage. And you can have multiple clusters on top of an individual set of storage. And so you have a lot of flexibility there. Additionally, when, when you're looking at how do you want to process data in the cube, especially when you're talking about big data, you have that need to be able to move the data around, to be able to process it, to get the the output that you want to be able to maybe apply some predictive analytics to it. And um, one of the newer features of Azure is Azure Data Factory. Azure Data Factory gives you the ability to take data from, from Hadoop, so you, all of your big data, take data from your virtual machines, take data from SQL databases, take data that's just out in the cloud, so public data sets, and pull that into your Azure environment make it a part of your data strategy and be able to process that data to visualize it as, 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 as it's going through so you can understand where the data came from and basically pull this all together in, in a batch mode. And pulling that all together gives you the ability to now not have to build out the resources and the on-premise components to run with this, this, this platform, but be able to take advantage of these newer data technologies and integrate them with what you're currently doing. And that brings us to the last area here. And the last area here is the business and predictive analytics. It's really the area that pulled me into SQL Server many, many years ago. The ability to find out and predict information based upon, or predict results based upon what the, uh, the data that you currently have. And the, the chief feature for doing this today within Azure is machine learning. Uh, machine learning is really, it's a, it's a pretty cool, pretty cool um, feature.
feature of, of Azure. It's basically the ability to predict model, predict um, outcomes, whether you're doing market basket, basket analysis, linear regression, and model those predictions to build up output and, and, and models that can be used to provide some inputs, and once you provide those inputs, get a result. Um, they can be integrated into a web service that allows you to productionize what you're doing. One of the biggest problems that I've had with um, times when I've tried to integrate predictive analytics into SQL Server solutions over the years or into data strategies over the years is that a lot of them run in a batch mode type of process where you get some data, you run your algorithms, then you get the output, and then you work from there. Um, if you don't go that way, then what you're doing is you're running through your, your modeling, you're getting it to the point where it's done, and then you're taking everything out and you're transcribing it into another platform so that you can leverage it. And whether it's that batch mode or whether it's that trans transcribe process, there's always a lot of issues in doing that because there's a lot of chances where you can not get to where you want to go. So with machine learning, you can integrate that in, use the models that are already there, or you can bring in your existing investments in R and Python into the mix and, and start building out solutions that way and integrate those web services into your applications, whether you're going to integrate them through Excel, whether you're going to integrate them through SSIS, whether you're integrating it directly through your application, but you can pull that information in. And one of the things that I've found is great with, and with the way in which machine learning has been built out is it's made it easy for us as data professionals who have been using Microsoft products for a while to dig into uh, because it's got a very SSIS-like interface. And so you don't have to learn so much the, the, the tooling behind it as you need to learn the concepts that go behind building out models. And it's a very easy way in which you can work directly with data scientists or with um, business analysts that are used to doing these types of activities and talk to them in a language that works well for you and for for those for for for, the, for those those folks as well. Now, the other area where you can integrate into analytics into your platform is with Azure Stream Analytics within Azure. So Azure Stream Analytics allows you to really do complex event-based um, calculations on your data as it's moving through the pipeline. You can take the data as it's coming through, you can measure it, you can return those results, and then you can store the data in um, an end source, an, an end destination. The nice thing about Stream Analytics is it gives you the ability to do something similar to per Perfmon counters on your data as it's coming through. So Perfmon will give you, say, reads per second. Azure Stream Analytics can give you something similar. You know, if you want to measure the number of red cars that are passing your house over a five-minute period, and that five-minute period is the current five-minute period that you're at, and that you know that five-minute period changes with every second, Azure Stream Analytics is actually the tool that can give you that capability and allow you to start doing those types of analytics on your data as it's flowing through your system. And so as, as we've gone through here today, I've kind of focused on our data lifecycle optimization, you know, the, this, this process that we've talked with a lot of our customers about, you know, from architecture all the way through enterprise BI, through predictive analytics. Um, these are really the areas where, you know, from a platform perspective, this is what you're already doing with, within your, your system. And as we've gone through, I've, you know, I've, I've tried to lay out some of the areas where Azure can kind of fit within these, where there's like some good, um, parity between the two, and hopefully as we've gone through, you've, you've kind of seen where you can start to take Azure and cloud capabilities and integrating them into what you're currently doing with data and being able to pull that all together to get the outcomes that you're looking for your platform. So hopefully um, this has been helpful for everyone and hopefully there's a few questions. Um, if there aren't any questions and, and you want to get get to know more and you want to find out more about you know where you are from a data lifecycle perspective or from a cloud readiness perspective and how you can integrate those in. Uh, we do have a couple uh, links that you can go through. I tried to make sure that the, uh, the, the links were easier, easy to transcribe from the screen here. And so at this point, if there are any questions, uh, let's start digging through those. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um... 
I define scale out as across VM, not adding more resources to existing VMs. I guess that's more of a statement than anything. <laughs> yeah, um, so scaling out applications and in, in, in all that, there's, there's basically two ways to look at it. You can scale up or you can scale out. Um, and uh, basically what you're talking about is scale out. Uh, someone wants to know what the cost difference between a local server and cloud architecture is. Um, <laughs> so that's a that's a great er, that's a great question to answer with a consultant to answer, which would be it depends. Um, but that said, um, I did take the costs that it takes for a virtual machine. I think it was an A8 with Enterprise Edition on it over a three-year period. Um, I compared that to what it would cost for just the SQL Server licensing um, over a three-year period, and it came out to be about the same. Uh, the difference in there is I'm talking about the licensing only for the SQL Server on-premise and the virtual machine only. And so what we're missing in that equation is what does it cost to own that physical hardware, power it, staff to maintain it, and all of those pieces. And so from a cost perspective, it's, it's, it's pretty effective to go with um, Azure. Now, there are ways where you can spend more than you need. Um, we had a customer that was they, they wanted to do um, their third-party um, application database hosting. And their initial plan was going to be, we're going to buy, we're going to put everything onto these four large VMs, because that matches what we have on premise. And so we'll go that route. And they looked at it, and they're like, that costs about the same as what we're currently paying for. Um, we went through and we redid the math on it, redistributed out everything. Instead of using four big machines, I think we went to, I think it was 12 smaller machines, and we got them down to, I think it was a third of the cost. Um, so it also depends on how you're going to you know, allocate out the resources. Okay. Um, can you switch resource, resource templates with an existing VM? Yes, you can. And it's pretty quick. Um, it is an outage, um, but it's still, it's it's pretty quick. I've gone from um, an A4 to an A8, and it was, I think it was offline for like 20 seconds or a minute or something like that. It was basically the, the time to reboot the machine. Okay. Um, what do you need to do from an infrastructure perspective to connect your environment to MS Editor? To MS Editor? Azure. Oh, Azure, okay. Um, so the main thing is, is that you set up, um, well, it depends on how you want to make, make it set up. And so let's go with the assumption that you want to make it so that any Azure machine that you create, so a virtual machine that you create, looks just like any other on-premise machine. Um, so from that perspective, the two main ways to go is you set up a virtual machine, I mean a virtual network. Uh, within that virtual network, you're either going to connect that to your uh, on-premise network by um, site-to-site networking or with express route and for both of those what they do is they 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 in, in two different manners create a VPN tunnel between your network and the Azure data center and it all just looks like an extension of what you already have okay um, what if public cloud Azure is not an option are there any Microsoft private cloud solutions for the mentioned technologies um, so there's a few there's a few options in there. Um, so in some cases, private cloud I mean public cloud not being an option um, relates to industry. Um, if 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 you're looking at it from an industry perspective, there is um, a, um, data centers directly for Azure government. So a lot of times government can't just be on the public cloud. So there there is a specific Azure government um, data center. Uh, when it comes to you know what's going on with the applications for security and regulations go, there is um, what I, what I generally tell people is to go to the Azure Trust site, and the Azure Trust site will explain what Azure's well what Microsoft's doing for the Azure platform to comply to standards like HIPAA and um, PCI to you know to make sure that their data centers can comply to those standards. Um, if, if you truly can't go to the public cloud, there is an appliance-based private cloud solution that Microsoft is working on currently. I believe they're doing that in partnership with Dell. Um, I don't know that it's quite out yet, um, but that, that is either 
available now or coming very shortly, which is going to give you a lot of the capabilities that you have with Azure. Um, of course, they're going to be a little bit delayed. And then the, the last way that you can look at is you can just build out Hyper-V clusters and bring in Azure packs, Azure management packs. And what Azure management packs will give you is some of those, some of the capabilities that you have for um, virtual machine management within a private cloud. Okay. Um, I see benefits with using Azure, but do we need an account for performance issues with connecting to the cloud? Example, should highly active transactional databases in SQL Azure? Uh, can you repeat the question? Yep. Um, do they need an account for performance issues with connecting to the cloud? Is the main part of it. An account with performance issues? Highly, and then no. they say highly active transactional databases in SQL Azure. Okay. I'm going to kind of guess at where they're kind of going with this, this question. So one of the things that was, uh, was an issue with a SQL database uh, from the beginning is, um, you know, issues with disconnects and things like that. Um, those have by and large been, been resolved. So the next part of what they might be getting for is when you're talking about highly transactional um, platforms, you may be talking about applications that are fairly chatty. Um, in those cases, um, if you've got a very chatty application, it is sometimes uh, beneficial to um, do some performance tuning on those applications to reduce the chattiness using things like multiple active result sets uh, within your application to reduce the number of round trips. Um, of course, with, with anything that is going out to the cloud, um, you know, similar to anything that's going out to the internet, the more round trips you make, the longer it's going to take. So you, you do have to account for that from a performance perspective within your applications. Um, if I totally missed where the, the questioner was going with that, please uh, um, ask in a, a variation of the question, and I'll, I'll try to make sure I get on to it, get, get, the, get where we need to be. Yeah. He he submitted something else again. He says, do you need an account for performance issues with using the cloud? So. Um, no, you just, I, I, I think, so, uh, so I think where you're going with that, do you need a specific account for, for the performance ones? And you, no, you just use a, a single account. Okay. And, and we are down to three minutes and we, I, I do have a hard stop. So probably okay. time for one or two more questions. Okay. I think we only have one last one. Oh, okay. um, what would be your recommendation in terms of source control? Would it be better to use development test environment and using TFS online in Azure? Um, actually, I think that's a great solution. We're doing we're actually doing that with a number of customers today. Okay. Um, one of the the things that completely outside of what we're talking about today is you know we we've if if you guys have seen we've been um, promoting our new ledge test software which. Um, some of our customers are implementing, and what we're doing for those customers is we're using Visual Studio Online, so the, the TFS Online, um, to build out full deployment processes, leveraging Azure as the development environment, um, and then building out tests for the code as it's coming, uh, as the code's being submitted and deployed, um, testing it as, as it goes through. So Azure for dev test and Visual Studio Online works great in continuous integration and continuous deployment scenarios. Okay. Well, that's all the questions we have for right now. Um, so if you guys do have any more questions that you think of after the session is over, please feel free to email Jason at jstraight at pragmaticworks.com, or you can email me, Liz. Um, it's the email that comes with all your go-to webinar stuff. Um, so like I said, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today.